Hello wonderful people and welcome back to the channel. Today I thought we would take another look at my local area, Farnham Castle. A popular wedding venue today and is situated on the edge of Farnham Town Centre, with cascading fields surrounding the other side. Like many of the buildings in Surrey, Farnham Castle dates from the Norman era and has Tudor influence in its design. The castle has gone by the names of Farnham Castle, Farnham Manor and Farnham Palace. The castle keep can be seen in this outline of the structure. Like traditional Mott and Bailey castles, it was built on top of a mot or mound and the palace is the triangular addition to the side and the two have intertwining but slightly separate histories. I will be touching on the Bishop's Palace but unfortunately it was only open to the public on Wednesdays and I went on a Monday, so sorry about that. I'm going to be touching on the Bishop's Palace, but the main focus will be the actual castle. Farnham Castle has played host to events in history such as the English Civil War, World War II, as well as the royals who have presided over them, such as the Tudors, Stuarts, Queen Victoria, and as most recent, Prince Edward, Earl of Wessex, as he was at the time because now he's Duke of Edinburgh. Today's video will be split into two parts. Part one, I will talk about the actual building itself, and part two, I will talk about the events, timeline, and the people that the castle witnessed. I will include chapters so you can skip if you want to, but before we dive on in, I would really appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. And if you like this video, then make sure you give it a thumbs up. In 688, Caedwalla, I think, King of the West Saxons, gave the land named Farnham to the church. And by 803, the rich manor had become part of the great estate belonging to the bishops of Winchester. This is why it's known as the Bishop's Palace, as this was the home of the Bishops of Winchester and was not a royal residence, something that probably had to be clarified to King James I. In 1070, the Normans seized the ancient and valuable bishopric of Winchester from the Anglo-Saxons. The wealth made the medieval bishops powerful men. Ruling monarchs often rewarded valued councillors with the bishopric. Bishop Rick. Bishops of Winchester served as Lord Chancellors, Lord Treasurers and Keepers of the Royal Seal. In the later centuries, the bishop's wealth and political influence declined as the balance of power between the church, crown and parliament shifted. Okay, I will apologise for the next bit. I have genuinely looked up the pronunciation for this guy's name. I still don't think I've got a grip on it, so I do apologise. But in 1129, King Henry I made his nephew, Henry of Blois, who was also the grandson of William the Conqueror, was Bishop of Winchester. Upon Henry I's death, Bishop Henry of Blois helped his brother Stephen seize the English throne from the legitimate heir, Empress Matilda. Fourteen years of civil war would ensue as a result. I'm now going to just refer to Henry of Blah as Bishop Henry because I'm not going through the rest of this video attempting to say his surname. In 1338, Bishop Henry built Farnham Castle. We know this as the Winchester Annals record that in this year, Bishop Henry built the castles at Murden, Farnham, Waltham, Downton and Taunton. The castle benefited greatly from its proximity to London and the Channel Ports. The journey to London was a frequent one for bishops. Being practically midway between the capital and Winchester, the castle provided a convenient stopover. It was built in the classic Norman style of a mott, earth mound, overlooking a bailey, a courtyard, which stood within a ditch and bank. From its earliest days, the castle's basic form has remained the same. An outer bank and ditch, a fortified keep, and a triangular inner courtyard sheltering domestic buildings, which is the Bishop's Palace. For 800 years, the castle served the Bishops of Winchester as a fortress, administrative centre and home. Development continued long after the medieval period, and this ensured the castle's survival. You can also see various Tudor additions 
throughout both the Bishop's Palace and the Castle Keep. Leading up to the castle is what is known as the Blind Bishop's Steps. These steps were built by Bishop Richard Fox, a trusted servant of King Henry VII. Valuing Fox's political and diplomatic skills, Henry gave Fox many titles before making him Bishop of Winchester in 1501. In 1509, King Henry VIII inherited his father's crown. Fox briefly remained in position of power, but with the rise of Thomas Wolsey, his influence quickly waned. He retired from government and devoted himself to long-neglected episodical duties. Guys, I promise I can read. In the last ten years of his life, Fox became blind, spending much of his time at Farnham Castle. Fox undertook a number of renovations and restorations to both the keep and the palace at Farnham Castle. It is at this time that he reputedly had the steps built between the castle and the town. The phrase seven by seven paces has become associated with these steps. It is not known if this originated from Richard Fox himself when commissioning the steps or not, but if you try counting out the sets of steps and by how many paces they are separated, you will find that there are seven sets of seven steps, seven paces apart. Try saying that ten times quick. It is believed Fox installed the steps from the town in sets of seven to make them easier for him to climb. Unfortunately, I didn't actually test this to see if it was true because I was too knackered from climbing the hill. I just wanted to get to the castle. Counting was not my priority. Breathing was. Then there's the keep. The early tower did not last long. It was probably pulled down in 1155 on the orders of King Henry II. By the early 13th century, a stone wall with five towers and a shell keep enclosed the mound. The mound still contains the massive foundations of the original Norman tower with a well below. In 1216, Prince Louis of France was invited to invade England in rebellion against King John. Now, some sources say that the French captured Farnham Castle, while others say it was gifted to Louis to stay in while he was in England. Either way, the French were at Farnham for 10 months. The Shell Keep was last used as a defensive structure during the Civil War between King Charles I and Parliament. Farnham Castle blocked the route from the King's western strongholds to the south and southeast, making it strategically important. During the war, Parliament held the castle for all but a few days. In 1648, Parliament ordered for it to be demolished so that it could play no further part in the war. After the return of the monarchy in 1660, Bishop Morley restored the bishop's palace, but left the keep in ruins. On top of the mound where soldiers once stood, the bishops planted an orchid and a garden. The drawbridge. In the Middle Ages, a deep pit blocked the way to the gatehouse. A drawbridge spanned the gap. Historians believe that the drawbridge would have connected the keep to the stairs and that the pavement that I'm standing on while filming this would not have existed. However, it was obviously filled in, otherwise I wouldn't be able to stand where I am slash was. While the Bishop's Palace provided luxurious accommodation, the keep offered a fortified refuge for troubled times. The bishop would flee directly across the drawbridge from his private chamber and a wooden staircase from the ground level allowed castle servants access. The gatehouse. Above the gatehouse, passage rooms housed the mechanisms to raise and lower the drawbridge and portcullis. On the right, you can see an arrow slit guards the gate approach. The portcullis, a heavy grating or iron or wood, came down through a slot that is still visible under the arch. Just inside on the left are two holes that held drawbars, used to lock shut a wooden door. If attackers gained access to the passage, defenders could drop missiles on them through a mirtier. That was probably awful pronunciation, but it is French, I'm assuming, or Latin at the very least, for murder hole. 
they could drop the missiles on them through this murder hole in the arch roof. Of the keep's five towers, the gatehouse is the only one where you can still see their original height. In the 1520s, Bishop Fox added another level. If you look up, you can see the additional Tudor brickwork. The Civil War During the Civil War, Farnham Castle's position made it strategically important. It stood between King Charles I in the west and his royalist supporters in Kent. It also guarded routes to gunpowder production and iron founding centres in the south and southeast. In October 1642, Parliament sent a garrison to Farnham. The next month, with reports of a royalist advance into Surrey, the garrison retreated. Royalists occupied the castle a few days later. Dragoons, that's dragoons with two O's, not dragons, I know, I'm, I'm sorry. I was just as disappointed as you are. Dragoons, under the command of Colonel Sir William Waller, stormed and retook the castle at the end of November. A parliamentarian soldier noted, The enemy appears in a great body upon a hill, in the heath above the park, about a mile from us. Our ordnance made divers shot at them, both from the castle and out in the park. In late 1643, royalist troops surrounded Farnham Park. Colonel Waller stood his ground in the castle and the Royalists eventually withdrew. The Royalists would try and fail again in January 1645. On the 4th of July 1648, the House of Commons ordered such effectual course with Farnham Castle as to put it in that condition of indefensibleness, as it may be no occasion for the endangering of the peace of that county. The keep never again served as a defensive purpose. Oh look, Oliver Cromwell, destroying more things. The square tower and, well, the builders of the first tower began constructing its walls far below where I was standing. The first tower may have stood for fewer than 20 years, and at the start of his reign, King Henry II ordered the destruction of many castles, including several that belonged to Bishop Henry. The height of the Finnish tower is unknown. Castles needed a water supply easily to hand, crucial when under siege. A well shaft extended below the tower. Sometime during the 16th century, a Tudor bishop had filled it in. The first keep. This here is the foundations of the original Norman Square keep, built here in about 1138. In the 1950s, restoration work on the Shell Keep unearthed the remains of doorways and unexpectedly, they uncovered a massive stone structure. These foundations of an earlier square keep had walls nearly three metres thick. That's ten feet, if you don't know what three metres is. You can use the stairs to climb down into the shaft. The space would have been divided into rooms, probably for storage. The top of the well lies at the very bottom. The Shell Keep. After King Henry II had the first castle tower demolished, work began on a much larger structure. We don't know who ordered the construction of the new keep, or when it began, but we do know it was completed before 1208. In the 13th century, the keep contained only the essentials for a small garrison, soldiers' lodging, the well, and the rooms for weapons and stores. During the next century, building activity greatly increased. Almost every one of the buildings in the bishop's palace had its counterpart in the keep, from chapel to kitchen. We are now entering part two of the video. The castle was built in 1138 by the Bishop of Winchester, who was also the grandson of King William I, and I cannot pronounce his name. In 1154, King Henry II inherited the throne, and Bishop Henry retired to the Abbey of Cluny in France. While he was away, King Henry ordered some of Bishop Henry's castles to be dismantled, which probably included Farnham, and we think the first tower that was here was pulled down in 1155. Farnham Castle was mainly used for church or state business, which brought the bishops this way, and until the 1300s, the castle buildings stood almost empty of furnishings most of the year, as the bishops would bring their furniture with them. In June 1215, King John signed the Magna Carta. Now, I know some of you in the comments might be like, He didn't sign it, he sealed it! 
I'm just saying the plaque that I read at the castle said that he signed it. Okay, I'm just going with the plaque said. But either way, it doesn't matter because the one that John signed did nothing anyway. In June 1215, King John signed the Magna Carta. His barons invited the Dauphin of France, Louis, to invade England, which he did in May 1216. Louis marched towards the capital at Winchester, and as mentioned earlier, he held Farnham Castle for 10 months. On the 21st of June, while Louis was at Farnham Castle, the Bishop of Winchester, Peter de Roches, Ferrero Rocher, was apparently loyal to King John but the garrison didn't offer any resistance to Louis. On the 18th of October 1216, King John died and his nine-year-old son inherited the crown and on the 28th, Peter de Rocher crowns the new boy king. The hostility to the monarchy died with John and a rebellion and Prince Louis was no longer needed. But Louis wouldn't leave, so on the 7th of March 1217, the Earl of Pembroke, William Marshall, accompanied the young King Henry III as they laid siege to Farnham Castle. The French lasted six days before surrendering. In September 1217, William Marshall negotiated a peace settlement and Louis returned to France. Despite nearly a year's occupation, little damage seemed to have occurred to the castle. In 1224, Henry III ordered Bishop Peter de Rocher to release an heiress who was held illegally at the castle for almost a year. We don't know if the bishop kept her in the dungeon, we don't know why he kept her captive, or for how long, or for why for so long, and I'm not even too sure who this heiress is. If it wasn't for the fact that I found this on one of the plaques at the castle, I would doubt its legitimacy as a source. Bishop Peter was a bit of a warrior monk as he led the king's crossbowmen at the Battle of Lincoln and when he lost his position at court, he joined the Sixth Crusade in 1227. Bishop Peter would die at Farnham Castle in 1238. In 1284, Bishop John de Pontoise, Pontoise? What is it with these names, man? It's because they're all French, it's because they're all Norman. In 1284, Bishop John de Pontois, that's what I'm going with, created a garden in the keep for a visit by Queen Eleanor of Castile. Constructing the garden took three weeks. We then skip three centuries. In 1554, Queen Mary I was getting ready to marry Philip of Spain in Winchester. On her way to Winchester, Mary stayed at Farnham Castle for two weeks. Her sister Elizabeth also visited Farnham several times on her summer progresses. In 1569, Bishop Horn warned the Queen of a plague outbreak occurring in the nearby county of Hampshire. It is thought that he had made more of the matter than needeth, as he didn't want to pay for the expense of the royal visit. Unfortunately for Horn, Elizabeth pitched up in the middle of August. William Camden briefly mentioned Farnham Castle in the first English guidebook in 1586. King James I was also a big fan of Farnham for the hunting scene. He leased the castle and its parks from Bishop Bilson between 1608 and 1616. He frequented the bishop's home so regularly that Bishop Bilson dared to ask him if he thought Farnham was an inn. One night when the king was staying, the stables caught fire. His guards didn't run to fight it as they feared it was a trick to leave the king unguarded. The king himself didn't even wake up. On the 27th of July 1620, John Chamberlain noted that while King James made a summer progress, he returned to London by Farnham Castle, where the Bishop of Winchester entertains him and makes account it will cost him a thousand pounds. During the war between Charles I and Parliament, Farnham Castle's position made it strategically important to both sides. Between 1642 and 1648, military activity at or near Farnham filled the newspapers. On the 14th of October 1642, Captain George Wither occupied the castle for Parliament. Nine days later, the civil war began at Edge Hill. As the King's army began advancing, Withers abandoned the castle. A small force under John Denham, High Sheriff of Surrey, seized the castle for the crown. 
A wide arc of royalist strongholds from Oxford to Marlborough now threatened Parliament. They launched an attack against the weakest link, which was Farnham Castle. You are the weakest link. In October 1642, Parliament sent a garrison to Farnham. The next month, with reports of a royalist advance into Surrey, the garrison retreated. Royalists occupied the castle a few days later. Dragoons, not dragons, under the command of Colonel Sir William Waller, stormed and retook the castle at the end of November. The attackers blew up the central gate of the gatehouse and stormed the keep. The ill-trained royalist force soon surrendered. The victorious soldiers had a good pillage for themselves to a good value. Royalists twice attempted to recapture it, but Farnham Castle remained in Parliament's hands for the rest of the war. Late in 1643, Royalist troops massed in the north of Farnham Park. Waller refused to be drawn from his defensive position around the castle, and the Royalists withdrew. They made one more unsuccessful raid in January 1645. On the 4th of July 1648, Parliament ordered that the keep be further demolished. The castle was sold and remained in private hands until the restoration in 1660. When the unpaid parliamentarian soldiers left, they took anything they could, leaving the castle in a ruinous state. Before 1660, some bishops of Winchester never even visited the castle. Others visited often, and some, like bishops Orleton and Fox, retired here after their eyesights began to fail them. After 1660, the castle became the bishop's main residence. George Morley spent ten years and a small fortune renovating the palace. Despite his wealth, he led a very simple life. In the coldest weather, he never had a fire when he arose, or a warming pan when he went to bed. He ate but once in the 24 hours. After the return of the monarchy in 1660, Bishop Morley restored the bishop's palace but left the keep in ruins. Explorer and writer Celia Fiennes wrote, The next day I went over the forest in sight of the Fairley Castle, which is the Bishop of Winchester's palace. It looks nobly on the hill. King George and Queen Charlotte would annually stay at Farnham with their children, as Bishop Thomas had tutored the king as a boy. Novelist Fanny Burney and friend of King George and Queen Charlotte wrote on the 2nd of August 1791 The castle is a good old building. I wish I could have climbed to the top of an old tower much out of repair. However, I was ready to fall already from only ascending the slope to reach the castle. Fanny, I could not agree more with you on that front. That hill is steep. And I saw some crazy people run up it. No, it was bad enough walking. Bishop Sumner was the librarian and chaplain to King George IV and arrived at Farnham Castle in 1827 with his wife and family. He was bishop for 42 years. Bishop Sumner turned the keep orchard into a large garden. He was the last of the prince's bishops and he lived at the castle until his death in 1874. He had seven children and more than 50 grandchildren. Christmas seems to have been a particularly memorable occasion. The Great Hall at Farnham, with its old oak fireplace, where the Christmas fire blazed lightly, the pictures gaily dressed with holly, the long tables stretched from end to end, round which were seated a joyous company of some 40 children and grandchildren with the bishop in their midst. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert also visited the castle, although their visit was brief. They once rode over from Aldershot. They inspected the Bible used for the coronation oath, admired the castle, and rode back again. In 1869, the Bishop's Resignation Act put all of the lands, titles, hereditaments, and endowments belonging to the bishopric in the hands of church commissioners. Once masters of the great estates and princely incomes, the bishops of Winchester became salaried employees. Bishop Frank V. 
Theodore Woods became the last Bishop of Winchester to live at Farnham Castle, and in 1927 the castle transferred to the newly created Bishopric of Guildford, ending an 800-year connection with Winchester. Makes sense, Guildford is closer to Farnham than Winchester. In 1939, Britain declared war against Germany, and in 1940, the country needed to conceal crucial installations from German bombers. Power stations, oil and water reservoirs, docks and railways, industrial sites and munitions factories. Farnham Castle was obviously not suitable for this new type of warfare, but it still had a defensive use. The War Office set up a camouflage development and training centre, known as the CDTC. Close to airfields and military bases, Farnham Castle provided the space needed for classrooms, demonstrations and accommodation. As the threat of invasion receded, Britain moved to a more offensive war. The emphasis on training at Farnham changed from concealment to deception, using decoys and dummies. From 1940 to 1942, Pauline Baines worked at Farnham Castle, making models for the CDTC. After the war, she became a well-known children's illustrator. Though she illustrated over a hundred books, she is still best known for her work illustrating Middle Earth and Narnia. In the 1950s, restoration work started on the keep, and most recently, although it's 15 years ago at this point, Prince Edward, now the Duke of Edinburgh, but he was Earl of Wessex at the time, visited the castle on the 8th of July 2008. I won't lie, I didn't expect to unearth as much information as I did about this castle, and there is still so much information that I just left out. So please, if you get the chance to visit Farnham Castle, please go, it's free, and maybe donate to English Heritage so they can afford to put soap in their toilets. Come on guys, we've just come out of a pandemic. Do you really think not having soap in your toilets is acceptable? Gross. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you share it with a friend, leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. But until the next one, have a wonderful day.